Hello everybody! For those of you who don't know, my name is Gabby Snyder and I do commentary for the Pokemon Video Game Championship Series and today I'm doing something a little bit different and I'm going to tell you all the things you need to know if you want to enter a Pokemon Video Game Championship Series tournament at the local level, at the regional level, international level, world's level, doesn't matter. This presentation will have this information in it. What this presentation will not have in it is what to expect at tournaments and anything discussing the current rule set for the video game championship series. This is an intentional choice on my part. I promise you that I will cover that information in later videos, so please stay tuned to this channel and obviously like, comment, subscribe, you know, that thing that all YouTubers say. So without further ado, we are going to get started with some key terms that you need to understand if you want to play Pokemon competitively. Now, obviously, um, there are a lot more words that are important that relate more to like the actual rule set and how we play the game. These words are just things that you may encounter when you're looking up tournaments online that may or may not make sense um, in the future or make sense to you at that point in time, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, um, you can find all of these words and more on the Pokemon website. Um, specifically, there's a tournament glossary link that will be in the video description or it's on your screen right now if you feel like typing it out. Um, and that is literally where I ripped all of these uh, entries from. So if you really like looking up terminology, I guess, you can just go there and you know reference it as needed. Um, so the first thing that I think is important to understand is like, how these tournaments are run. So um, in Pokemon, specifically uh, in competitive Pokemon, tournament structures usually have um, two sort of phases. Phase one is what's called the Swiss pairings rounds. And then phase two is a single elimination rounds. Um, and Swiss pairings are a very kind of cool, in my opinion, tournament structure, because with that method, every single player will play every single round. Um, there's a mathematical equation that you can do that'll basically say if you have this many players They can play for this many rounds and then you'll end up with you know One person who's undefeated and then like five people who've only taken one loss and you can sort of rank people uh, Based off their win-loss record and in order to calculate that every single round of that tournament You face somebody with the same win-loss record that you have so um, it's basically a way to allow people to compete for the maximum period of time, which is really cool. But also, um, you know, they, you don't get paired up against someone you've already played. And in theory, if, um, if the Swiss triangle, as it's called, plays out correctly, you're playing someone who is relatively at your skill level. So it, it's a really uh, fun way to run tournaments because you do get to play all day. Um, you do get to play all rounds if that's what you decide to do. Um, obviously, some people will choose to drop after a certain point when it's clear that they're not in contention for championship points, which we will discuss a lot later. So, you know, be excited for that. Um, but you do have the option, which is an improvement over <laughs> the way Pokemon tournaments were run when I started playing back in the Dark Ages. Uh, with single elimination tournaments. And as the name implies, you lose once, you lose a single time, you're out. <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit rough, um, which is why now in the way uh, these tournaments are run, you only see single elimination rounds towards the end of a tournament, or uh, top cut is sort of the colloquial term for it. And the idea is after, you know, X number of Swiss rounds, you end up with the top Eight, top 16 top 32 players depending on the tournament size um, and then all those players will be matched off one by one usually based off standings um, so like the player in first place will play the player in eighth place if you're at a top eight tournament and you know every single round you'll eliminate the losing player until you have one player left and they are then the winner of the tournament um, it's a pretty decent system at that point in time. There's a lot on the line. And what's really fun from a spectator's point of view is, you know, if you have the first and the eighth seed playing and the eighth seed wins, then it's like, oh my God, it's an upset kind of thing. So it, it's exciting. Uh, but believe it or not, when Pokemon tournaments started, these single elimination was it. You, you lost once and then that was it. So, um, it's pretty great that we have the combination of Swiss and the single elimination because you do get the hype that a single elimination tournament brings, but you also get to play. So, you know, playing's important. 
Um, in terms of how rounds are uh, run, a round being like, you know, a single, um, I guess, like step in the tournament, um, you either play best of one or best of three uh, games. And the idea is, um, you know, you sit down with your Switch or your 3DS, um, you play one Pokemon battle. And if you're in a best of one tournament, whoever wins that one Pokemon battle will be the winner of that round. If you're playing in a best of three tournament, you play uh, up to three games. Um, so if I win the first game and then I win the sec, or if I win the first battle and then I win the second battle, then I'm the winner of that round because I won two out of the three games. If I win, um, you know, the first battle and then my rival Gary um, <laughs> wins the second battle, then we play a third battle, and whoever wins that battle will wi will win the round. Um, usually what happens is after someone wins two games, two battles, um, you're done. Uh, people won't usually play the last game at that point. Um, it's really to save time. Um, it, it, a lot of times with Pokemon tournaments, you know, you do have to worry about the clock and if rounds run faster, that usually means the, you get out sooner, you can go get lunch or food or whatever. So, um, just be prepared that if you're sitting down for the first time at a best of three tournament and you win or lose the first two games or battles of that set, then congratulations, you're done. You don't have to play any more Pokemon until the next round. Um, the next term we're kind of shifting more into like championship point stuff now, um, is known as a BFL or a best finish limit. And the idea is that, um, only X number of tournaments will count towards your championship point total when it comes to qualifying for the world championships or, um, you know, qualifying for travel awards. Um, it's meant to even, uh, the playing field since um, not everybody has the same number of tournament organizers or tournaments accessible to them. Um, so if you play in like 12 events and your rival Gary only plays in six events, you know, it's not really fair because, you know, you've had the time and money and opportunity to go to 12 and Gary's just like, well, I don't know what to do. I only have six. Um, it's uh, pretty pretty straightforward. The idea is only your best finishes within that best finish limit will count towards your championship point total. Um, so going back to our 6 and 12 example, since that's apparently the numbers I'm dealing with right now, um, if I finished top four in seven tournaments and then, I don't know, like second place in five tournaments, then I would have five second place rankings and then one uh, top four uh, finish in terms of how my championship points are counted. And we'll get into a more theoretical example of how that works later. Um, these are very important, by the way, just because um, a lot of times when it comes to figuring out the easiest way for you to qualify for the world championships, um, you know, you really need to sit down and look at the tournaments available to you and look at how you've done in the past. Because a lot of times, if you already have, you know, like four first place finishes in a premier challenge, um and then uh i don't know you like you have another tournament you could go to but the bfl for a premier challenge is five like it doesn't really make sense to go compete because you can't earn any more points i mean mind you you still could there's nothing physically stopping you and i know a lot of times tra people will just like to go to those like their local events after they max out their bfls just to have fun and i totally encourage that but um, when it comes to some of the larger events, you know, it, it's nice to know whether or not you actually need to go to something versus whether or not you're going for fun. And it also takes a lot of the pressure off as well. Um, a tournament organizer, as the name implies, is the person who organizes the tournaments you go to. Um, they come in different levels. I believe there's three different levels, but I'm not 100% on that. It's kind of irrelevant to this presentation. <laughs> um... But they're the ones who organize your locals. They'll organize uh, regionals and higher level tournaments as well. Um, please thank your local TOs. Um, they're usually really nice people. You know, they're volunteering their time to put on these tournaments for us. And they're really cool. So say thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just really wanted to put this in here to remind people to thank their TOs. Um, and last but not least, uh, kickers. Kickers are very, very, very important when we talk about championship points. Um, because they're basically these thresholds that say, if you have X number of people show up, we're going to reward championship points for, uh, you know, top Y players. 
Um, and the idea is that the more people who compete in a tournament, the harder it is in theory. Um, the longer it lasts, you know, maybe the more rounds you had to play to do well. And your rewards should scale relative to the effort that you put in to compete. So um, we're going to talk a lot more about actual examples later, but just to get you thinking along the right lines, if an age division has at least eight players, then third and fourth place finishers get points. But if they have less than eight, um, you know, only the first and second place uh, finishers will earn championship points because at that point, you're playing like maybe two or three rounds to decide who those top two players are. So it doesn't really make sense to be giving everybody like a million championship points at that point. Um, so you've heard me say this word a lot. Um, I'm going to talk more about it in a second. My voice is starting to give on me a little bit. All right. Let's freaking go. So championship points. <laughs> um, championship points are points you earn when you play at po play Pokemon events. And the idea is if you get a certain number of championship points, um, if you score above the CP bar, as it's called, uh, champion CP being an abbreviation for championship points, um, you will qualify for the world championships. In the past, um, there actually hasn't been a, a bar. Um, the idea was whoever had the most championship points in a certain range um, would just get a qualification for the world championship, but that just, uh, in my opinion and experience led to a lot of burnout. <laughs> so, um, what's really nice about this system is that, you know, after you perform, you know, a, a certain, as, as, as long as you get 400 championship points, if you're a master, um, living in the U S or Canada, you know, you have your world championship day one invite locked down, and then you can decide to take a break from competing. Um, now, there are still rewards given to players who are the top eight within a given rating zone, and you can see the various rating zones on your screen in this lovely table I did not copy from the Pokemon website. Um, but those travel awards to other tournaments are um, honestly really difficult to get, and if you're a beginning pl player, I would highly recommend setting your goal to be qualifying for day one of the World Championships. Um, if you do get enough championship points, you can earn a day two qualification, but just like those travel awards, it's really difficult to do. Um, and the players who do that are some of the best of the best. And if you're looking for a obtainable goal for your first year of Pokemon, you know, these are it. And obviously, um, there are three age divisions on this table, junior, senior, and masters. Um, the dates for like who is in what uh, division change every year, but usually the idea is juniors are, I think, uh, kids 10 and under, seniors are 10 to 15, and then maybe masters is everybody above that. I can't remember exactly. I'm a master, obviously. I'm old. Um, when I started playing, we didn't even have the junior division. It was just you're either a senior or a master, but that's, you know, that's beyond this uh, thing. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really just important, again, know these numbers because these are going to be your goals depending on where you live and um, what age you are when it comes to qualifying for Worlds. So now that we've sort of discussed how where the CP bar is for Worlds, um, let's go ahead and talk about the different kinds of tournaments that will give you championship points. Um, the lowest possible level tournament that isn't an online tournament is a uh, premier challenge. Uh, these are typically held in local venues by your local TOs. Um, every tournament organizer gets, I think one premier challenge a month, but I could be wrong about that. So don't quote me. Um, but the idea is that these are very, you know, low cost, low barrier of entry events designed specifically for newer players um, to the championship series, to competitive Pokemon can go and compete and, you know, start getting engaged with those people who are more active in the scene. Um, you do not need an invitation to play. You do not need a qualification. You can literally just show up the day of to a premier challenge, pay the entry fee, which is usually very reasonable and then compete. Um, these events are a lot of fun. Again, they're a lot more lower key um, than some of the other tournament types that we're going to be talking about. And they really allow you to sort of get a idea of what it's like to play this game at a higher level. 
And I think more importantly, they allow you to sort of test out different strategies and try to figure out what you do want to do for larger tournaments. Um, as you can see, the uh, championship point payout for these is relatively low. Um, if you have a first, if you win, if you have a first place placement, if you win, um, you win 30 championship points. And this will happen as long as the event is sanctioned. And I believe you only need eight people across all age divisions to get a sanctioned event. But again, don't quote me on that. Check the Pokemon website. Um, if you get second, you get 16 championship points. If you get top four, that is the third or fourth place, you get 12 championship points. All of these will happen regardless of how many people show up for your age division. Um, if you want to get uh, championship points for placing in the top eight, 24 people have to show up to that tournament to compete. Um, if you want to get championship points for getting top 16, 48 people have to show up. And for top 32 championship points, which I think hasn't actually happened in the history of VGC, maybe barring like a pre-event um, like tournament, I, or pre like regional premier challenge or something, you have to get over 100 people. Um, usually these events are Swiss rounds followed by top cut, but this is at the discretion of the tournament organizer. Actually, um, but if it's not Swiss event rounds followed by top cut, it's usually just Swiss. Like there's no tournaments that are just single elimination. Um, so you'll play four rounds and then you'll be done. Um, and these can be best of three or best of one. Again, this is up to the tournament organizer. A lot of it has to do with like time and what's available to them, um, you know, at the venue or maybe how they're feeling that day or whatever. Um, you should always check the tournament info on the Pokemon website for specifics about any given event. Um, we will talk about the event locator in a little bit. So just remember, double check everything, read it twice, go to your locals. Um, now, the lowest possible level of tournament that isn't in person, <laughs> and I make that sort of clarification here because there are online tournaments um, that are held maybe like three or four times a year. Um, I'm not sure how this is going to work with Sword and Shield, obviously, but I can talk about how it's worked in the past with the 3DS and even the DS, honestly. Um, the idea is that these international challenges are tournaments held completely online. Um, whenever Pokemon feels like holding them, um, you play best of one games. You're just matched up like you're playing on the Battle Stadium ladder or Battle Spot, as it was known last generation. Um, and the format is whatever is relevant to VGC at that point in time. Now, this is a very confusing name because there's also some higher stakes tournaments held called Ch International Championships. We'll talk about those later. Um, but yes, international challenges are um, completely online. You can play in your pajamas, no cost of entry. You just have to be able to access the internet from your console. And um, if you win, you get 50 championship points. And But that winning usually means you do the best in your rating zone. So you're competing against everybody in the US and Canada, if you're me. Um, and then as you can see here, the payouts go pretty deep. Um, you can get one championship point if you place within the top 1,024 people. That is actually a pretty reasonable goal in these tournaments, just because a lot of people will play a few games. Um, there's usually some sort of freebie in the game associated with them. Um, like with the Galar uh, like intro tournament that's happening this weekend on the Nintendo Switch, you get 50 ba uh, battle points for entering, just, just for entering. Um, and it's, it's a very nice way, again, to sort of figure out what competitive Pokemon is like, earn a couple championship points that may or may not be important later, which we'll get to. Um, and yeah, just just to try playing Pokemon at a, at a higher level. Um, the next level of tournament that you can enter is a mid-season showdown. Again, these are local tournaments, but they're a little bit more competitive uh, than Premier Challenges. They also have a BFL of uh, six per year. Um, and as you can see here, uh, if you win a mid-season showdown, you actually get 50 championship points, which is a really um, a nice chunk of change, honestly. <laughs> um, the idea, though, is that these are still primarily local tournaments where you can go uh, fairly easy to enter, and um, you can try out ideas and take things, you know, a little bit seriously, more serious than your premier challenge. Um, I think that you have to be like a certain level of tournament organizer to host these. 
so they're not available to everyone but um every tournament organizer to host i mean um but they are open to everybody to come play you do not need an invite you do not have to qualify for these tournaments you just show up pay your entry fee if there is one and then you can go ahead and play um and the kickers for these are you know a little bit more um i think rewarding than the premier challenge kickers um a top four finish in a mid-season showdown will net you 32 championship points and that's that's a really nice number to have honestly um and as you can see the rewards again go up depending on how many people decide to compete um, I think the average mid-season showdown right now is around that 20 to 30 person mark, at least in my neck of the woods. So um, it's, a, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty nice. And a lot of tournament organizers will also host their mid-season showdowns on the same day as a premier challenge. So you can do both, which is also really great. Um, now, this is where we start getting serious. Regional championships are the, um, I think, sort of the premier and I hate using that word because there is a premier challenge, but like the Pokemon event that a lot of people think about when you say I'm going to a Pokemon tournament, um, they're usually held, um, you know, throughout the year. There's a huge list of them on the Pokemon website. Uh, but the idea is, you know, these are the tournaments that you travel to. These are the ones that kind of tell you, okay, these are the people who I should watch out for. These are the people who are clearly, you know, they know their stuff. They know their Pokemons. <laughs> um, and uh, they're actually the largest events held in terms of the attendance and the championship point payout, which is something interesting to note. Um, if you win a regional championship, not only do you get a cool trophy, you get 200 championship points. There, us there is usually some cash prizes that are rewarded in addition to what we see here. Um, and... It's a, uh, they're a lot of fun to enter. Um, there is no qualification. There is no sort of like you need X amount of CP or play points or whatever to enter these tournaments. Um, but the, they usually require some um, like travel. Uh, you have to like fly or maybe drive, but they're worth the trip. Um, there's vendors there. It's a great opportunity to like meet other people who are just as excited about Pokemon as you are. And it's also a really good opportunity to just kind of play in a tournament and just have that sort of experience. Um, there will be Swiss rounds followed by Top Cut, depending on the tournament organizer. Um, Swiss rounds will be on Saturday, then Top Cut will be on Sunday. Um, Championship Sunday is kind of the term that a lot of commentators have co coined for it. Um, these tournaments are always going to be held in best of three format. Um, and they also have a BFL limit of six along with the other tournaments we've had. Um, you will need a pop ID to enter these tournaments, but we'll talk about how to get one of those later. And as you can, again, as you can see, the championship point payouts are really nice. And if you're trying to qualify for the world championships, a majority of your championship points will most likely be from regional championship finishes. And, um, we'll, again, we'll talk more about that later. Um, Special premier events are identical to regional championships, but the idea here is that these can sort of pop up whenever, wherever. Um, I don't really know what the qualification or what determines when a special premier event happens, but you can find a list of these on the Pokemon website. And usually these pop up around conventions or um, just like other happenings that may benefit from having a Pokemon event with them. Uh, the championship point payout is the same and these count towards the same BFL as regional events. They're like, they're just identical. It's just, they call them different and there's some, some, uh, I don't know, pedantic reason they're different, but I have no idea. And as far as we care, it's a regional. <laughs> um, and now, okay, now we're kind of at the big guns. So um, international championships are the big tournaments that happen Four times a year, there's one-ish per rating zone. So there's one in the U.S. There's one in Europe this year. It's actually in Germany. Um, there was one in Brazil, and then there will be one in Australia. And these are the events that really try to showcase the best of the best and, and figure out who are the trainers that we have to sort of keep an eye on going into the World Championships. As you can see, if you somehow win a international championship, you basically get your World's Invite right off the bat 500 championship points you get some cash money prizes um you get a cool trophy you get some cards like th these are uh really sort of high caliber events and the payouts scale with that 
but getting down towards sort of the bottom level of you know the championship point payout um right now i think international championships are hovering between the 100 200 person entry range we'll see if that number increases once sword and shield is the format i really think it's going to um but you can earn a hundred championship points for example by placing top 128 at a um, international championship that is literally a quarter of your world's invite if you live in the u.s and even more than that if you live elsewhere um these are the tournaments that really make or break world's invites for a lot of trainers and because of that they're super super important um but they're also really hard to get to um usually i would say people plan to attend one maybe two of these depending on you know who they are where they live um whether or not they get a travel award um which is given to the top eight ish people um in a uh, rating zone every before every uh, international championship um so they're also a lot of fun to attend like i've been to a bunch of these now uh thanks to commentary which i'm incredibly thankful for but you know, there's like a coloring zone and like Pikachu will show up and there was a ball pit in Brazil and nobody invited me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> there was a ball pit in Brazil though, um, which reminds me of TumblrCon, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it's a lot of fun and I would highly, highly, highly recommend if you have the means, um, try and attend at least one of these events. You can find the locations and the dates on the Pokemon website. Um, and these are like things that I would structure, you know, a vacation around. So I'm going to go play some Pokemon and then, you know, go explore a fun city. Like Berlin is where it's happening in Europe this year. And Berlin looks amazing. I'm, I'm really excited for Berlin. I'm, I'm going regardless. <laughs> but um, that being said, we're going to actually take a moment here to do some math and sort of look at what a realistic uh, world's invite season would look like. Um, I want to thank my fiance Chalky for these numbers. This is actually his plan to qualify for Worlds this year, so thank you for doing the math. I, I appreciate you. <laughs> um, but as you can see here, um, his plan is pretty modest. Um, the idea is uh, there are no winning tournaments. Um, his best placement is a top four in a Premier Challenge. And as you can see, um, he has uh, three top 64 finishes at a regional, which will net him a total of 150 championship points. Um, three, three top eight, excuse me, finishes at the midseason showdown level. That'll give him 75 championship points. Uh, six top four placements at Premier Challenges. Remember, Premier Challenges are your local events. They're very easy to access. There will be a lot of them. Um, so you have many opportunities to get that top four placing uh, for 72 championship points. And then one international championship top 128 placement for 100 championship points. And then a measly three championship points from international challenges, those online tournaments. That all adds up to 400 out of 400. That is all you need to qualify for Worlds. It's, it is difficult. You do need to achieve a certain level of consistency when it comes to competing. But you can do it. Like this is, I would say, as long as you're willing to put the time in and practice and, um, you know, make an effort to travel to a few regionals and all of your locals until you reach those uh, best finish limits, um, you can do this. And the other thing that I think is really important to call out is that for the midseason showdowns, he's only counting on getting championship points from three out of the total six afforded to him in the best finish limit. If you're able to get um, six top eight placements at midseason showdowns, that is going to be a total of 150 championship points, which will mean he doesn't have to do as well at the regionals or maybe even at an international championship. It's super easy to do. And I think that's, you know, I, I think this is really important to call out. Like, day one of the Pokemon World Championships is meant to be a celebration of all this work that you put in. How you've grown as a Pokemon trainer and just how you've sort of, you know, er, done this. You, you've done this incredible thing. And I think that these championship point payouts and I think the way that the structures currently or the circuits currently organized is really conducive to that. So um, if you're thinking about going for Worlds this year, you still have plenty of time to hit these numbers. I highly recommend you look into it. 
Um, but yeah, how do you sign up for tournaments? Uh, if you're, if I've sold you on this yet, great. If not, feel free to bookmark this for later. Um, you will need a pop ID from the Pokemon website. You can also get these in person, but um, if you just go up to the Pokemon website and sign up for an account, a trainer club account, you can actually add a pop ID to your account from there. Just one less thing you have to worry about the day of. Um, I also, <laughs> funny story, um, when I competed in a um, tournament in Hawaii to try and qualify for the World Championships a few years ago, back when they did last chance qualifier tournaments for the World Championships, um, they gave me a new pop ID because I lost mine. Like, it, it, you just don't want to worry about that stuff. <laughs> um, it was very stressful the day of. Um, so yeah, go to the Pokemon website, sign up for an account if you haven't already, add a pop ID to your account if you haven't already, write it down, memorize it, um, I don't know, maybe like write it on your arm or something, um, very important number. Um, when you sign up for tournaments online, um, or in person, you will need that number, because that's how they associate you with, you know, the system. Um, and then after that, just look for a tournament event. Um, for a tournament event. <laughs> um, you can go to the Pokemon website. Uh, the URL is right on there um, to find an event. There's also this website made by someone in Australia. I forget his name, but I love him. Um, <laughs> PokeCal.com will actually set up a calendar for you in Google Calendar or whatever um, to sort of tell you when your locals are, what kind of events you want. Um, the Pokemon website can be difficult to navigate, so these things are just really important, I think, to, um, you know, just keep an eye on. But yeah, that, that's literally it. That's all you need to do to get to these tournaments, besides bringing a legal team and all that stuff, which, again, we'll get to in another video. So yeah, these are the important links, uh, from this presentation. I just want to thank you all for listening. And if anybody has any questions, um, now's the time to ask them in chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to end this video and we can go back to playing some actual Pokemon. Because uh, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> that was a lot of talking. Oh my god. Oof. Also, oh my god. I, I missed some notifications. Oh yes, thank you Fluffy. Um... Pro Fluffy in the chat said there are also discords for local areas. Um, the Pacific Northwest has one that I'm not in. Um, there's SoCal. Uh, there's a SoCal Discord. Um, there's also a, a Reddit um, for VGC, which I'm going to post in the chat right now, but also um, in the video description called RVGC that has a tournament organizer locator who tells you who's your local tournament organizer, depending on what region you're in. Um, if you want to reach out to them directly, maybe you have some questions, maybe you want to like talk with them before you show up at an event, maybe you just want to tell them randomly that you love them, I don't know. Um, but that information is there as well. Um, so I, there's one question about the validity of Pokemon and how to tell if someone is okay to compete in a tournament. Um, the simple answer to that is there is an online check, and that is why it is required for all events being held in Sword and Shield um, that you have a Nintendo Online membership so your Switch can access the internet so that tournament organizers can run this check. Um, that's all I'm going to get into that. Like, that's a whole other rabbit hole, um, which, quite frankly, I don't know anything about. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's... It, that that that's my answer to that question um yeah is there anything else i wanted to say um i will say for those of you who joined while i was talking hello uh shout outs to some new followers I, actually no i won't do this now this is this is still going to be on youtube i'm going to do my my youtube outro and then i'm going to say thank you to my new followers <laughs> yeah sorry guys i turned off uh notifications during this um Thank you all for watching, and for those of you who are watching the VOD, apologies for the random Twitch talk at the end of it. Um, there will My next video will be on what to expect when you're competing at a tournament, like what stuff to bring, like what you should be mentally, physically, emotionally prepared for, um, where to find Pikachu at events, because this is something that I personally care about. 
Um, and yeah, just like some tips and tricks I've learned throughout the years of competing at these things. So thank you guys so much for watching. I love you all and have a great day, night, or afternoon, depending on what time it is. All right. See ya. Okay, and now I'm just going to like stop the recording because yeah.